The title of today's message is No, No Greater Love. No Greater Love. Bow with me in prayer as we look at God's Word today. Let's pray. Father, in these few moments that we have together today, I pray that you would speak to us of an eternal truth, an eternal truth from your Word that would give each one of us hope and assurance and an understanding Not only that you love us, but that without you, without your son, without placing our faith and our hope and our trust in your son, Jesus, we we face a godless eternity. And so, Father, today I pray you would anoint this time and speak to us from your word as only as only you can. It's in the name of Jesus. We pray these things. Amen. If you want to uh, grab your Bibles, we're going to look at the story of Nicodemus, John chapter 3, verse 1, kind of begins to paint in broad strokes this image of the two men sitting down together when it said there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. Now, we don't, we just hear the word Pharisee and hear where people call other individuals a Pharisee, somebody who says one thing and does another, sets a high standard for other people, is very legalistic about every little detail, but may or may not follow it themselves, is kind of the idea behind a Pharisee. But, but in Jesus' day, the Pharisees began actually before Jesus' day, probably uh, 200 years B.C., uh, 200 years before Christ. They were, the word Pharisee, it actually means separate or separatist. It was this group of lay, uh, lay leaders who were part of the Jewish community, and they had devoted themselves to a strict following of the law. They wanted to make sure that they never went back and sinned again as a nation because they had just come out of exile and they didn't want to go back and do that again. And so the idea of it, where they would, where they were. They were religious. They were, they were very focused. They were very dedicated to making sure that they followed every aspect of the law. They didn't want to ever go down that road again. And on, on the front end of that, that makes all kinds of sense to me. I mean, you know, I, we talk often about the number of times that I got a licking growing up and deserved every single one of them. But I'll tell you what, there was a day when I said, I'm not even going down that road anymore. And I was 56. No, it was much younger. <laughs> it was much younger than that. But I said, I, you know what? I don't like getting a spanking. I don't like being disciplined. So I don't want to go down that road. So I'm going to set up some, some, some boundaries. If my curfew was 11 o'clock, I didn't come sliding into the driveway at you know 10:59 and 59 seconds and put my foot in the door no i was home 15 minutes early just to be careful and and i think most of us can understand that we understand that idea but what happened was that the pharisees had began to develop not just following the law but began putting extra barriers in that many people call the hedge laws it was like if the edge of this stage is dangerous and I don't want to go there, then they put the line right here. In fact, not only the line right here, but maybe the line right here. And maybe maybe the line all the way back here so I don't get anywhere near that. He was a ruler of the Jews. And, and we see, um, it, because of his position, we believe he was rich. You say, well, pastor, does, does the Bible say he was rich? It, it does. I'll read this to you. You can just mark this in your mind and and remember this. In John chapter 19, after Jesus had died on the cross, Scripture says, After this, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but secretly, for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus, and Pilate gave him permission. So, So Joseph of Arimathea came and got the body of Jesus. Verse 39 says, And Nicodemus, who at first came to Jesus by night, also also came. So Nicodemus came with Joseph of Arimathea. Maybe you didn't know that, but John records it. And it says, Bringing a mixture 
of myrrh and aloe, about 100 pounds. Now, the Roman measurement for weight was different than ours. It was actually 12 ounces of Roman weight was a pound as opposed to our 16 ounces. So it was about 75 pounds in our understanding of this ointment to to prepare the body for burial. And they they wrapped the body, they anointed it, wrapped the body in the cloth and and placed Jesus' body in the tomb. 75 pounds of this ointment would not have been cheap. And so for Nicodemus to, one, have the money to be able to do that, and two, willing to do it for Jesus speaks a great deal of his character. But Nicodemus came to Jesus by night, and I believe he was a follower of Jesus the rest of his life. And verse 2 says, this man came to Jesus by night. Some say that he came by night because he was afraid. He was afraid of what the other Jewish people would say. He came to him by night because his day was so busy and Jesus was so busy. This was a period of time he could actually sit and be alone, undistracted with Jesus. However you want to look at it, Jesus and Nicodemus sat down together in the evening at night. And, and Nicodemus said, Rabbi, again, hear, hear the respect Hear the respect. He recognized Jesus as a great teacher. He's not dismissing him. He knows there's something going on. Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Verse 3 says, Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Jesus doesn't even address the compliment that Nicodemus pays him. Jesus doesn't say, well, thank you very much. My Father in heaven has given me that. He doesn't even address it. Jesus cuts right to the chase. He gets right to the heart of it and says, unless you're born again, you can't see the kingdom of God. Unless you're born again, you can't go to heaven. Nicodemus is confused by this. Again, most of us know this story. Verse 4, Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? I mean, that's just ludicrous. That, that doesn't even make any sense, Jesus. What you're saying doesn't fit into the realm of understanding in front of me. I can't touch that with my hands. And as we said, The word of God is heard and received by faith. And Nicodemus was struggling with this. And so he continues, Jesus answered and said, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born born of water and the Spirit, unless you're born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Jesus gives this statement and, and, and explains, you know, kind of in code almost to to Nicodemus, unless you're born of water. Well, where does water come from? Water, water comes down from above in the form of rain. In our world, water comes down from above in the form of, of snow, but it comes down from above. It's not something you and I conjure up ourselves. It's something that drops from the heaven. In fact, not only that, but in this passage, in this passage, Jesus speaks about the water, which comes down from above, the wind, which we got to see a good share of it uh, the last several days, it comes from above and all over. It doesn't come, I, I don't conjure that, I don't make that happen. I don't make the wind move around me. No, it comes from above. And the Spirit of God comes down from above. Jesus is saying to Nicodemus, and this is something that is, is important for all of us to understand, that salvation comes from God down to us. It's not something that we do from the earth and from manhood, personhood up to him. No, it's something that God has made available to us. In verse 6, Jesus explains that which is born of the flesh, like you and I are born of the flesh, we're flesh. And that which is born of the spirit is spirit. That, that which is born from above is spirit. He says in verse 7, do not marvel that I say to you, you must, you must be born again. And so in the verses that continue, Nicodemus and Jesus go back and forth and he says, I don't understand how these things can be. Jesus, can you explain this to me? And Jesus is amazed and says, you know, Nicodemus, you're a teacher of the law. 
You're somebody that you have the Old Testament in front of you. You study it and you can teach it to people and yet you don't understand this because I believe that Nicodemus, like many of us, was very concrete in his thinking. He, he, he had a hard time grasping and understanding the mystery of God, the mystery of the Holy Spirit, the mystery of the coming Messiah, and yet he knew there was something different about Jesus who was in front of him. And it leads us, as the discussion continued, it lead us, leads us to probably the most famous verse in all of Scripture. It's John 3, 16. Read this together with me. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting, everlasting life. Most everybody knows this verse. It's one of the first verses that we learn. Somebody said that John 3, 16, uh, it, 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 it encapsulates the entire gospel message in it. Now, there's obviously more to the gospel and understanding it, but boy, oh boy, does this, really, does this really make a lot of sense and does it get right down to it? But it's so often when we think about this verse, we read it, but we don't pause to think about it. When I, when I thought about this week of Advent and thinking about God's love for us, I couldn't help but think about this verse. And I just, I just want to break it down for us today. Most of this you have already heard and you know. But there are some of this that you're going to hear and you're going to say, you know what, I, had, I didn't catch that before. It says, for God, for God so loved. The God of the universe that created the world in which we live, the heavens and the earth. Yes, the snow that we're enjoying outside and the sand that some of you will look forward to enjoying at some point. The life that we know, the creator himself. God, God so loved. This word so is often described by some people, and I've even said it this way, God so loved the world, the degree to which God loved the world. Yes, it means that, but it also has another meaning. And it's not just he loved us so much, but he, he loved us in this manner. God in this manner, in this way, as I'm about to tell you, this is how God loved us. And can I just tell you right now, this is how God loves each and every one of you. Sometimes we say, I know that God loves the world, but I don't know that he loves me. God loves you too. And John is explaining this, again, recording these words of Jesus, the manner that God loved us. He goes on and he says, for God so loved, for God so loved the world. I, I, you know, if we think about this, we say, oh, he's got the whole world in his hand. This, this word that's translated in, in, in our Bibles, for God so loved the world. If you look to see what it means in the Greek, it means decoration. For God so loved the decoration. You think about this, this uh, decoration, this or, or not just decoration, but ornament. For God so loved the ornament. At Christmas time, what an appropriate verse for us to remember. We put these ornaments all over the tree. We put these, these um, decorations all over the tree to be able to brighten it up and make it look cheery. But, but could it be? Could it be that this tradition has been so forgotten because we've just gotten used to doing it, but the tradition was there to remind us, for God so loved this decoration that he spun into earth, or spun out through space? I did some looking and found that, that the earth spins at the equator at about a thousand miles per hour at the equator, a thousand miles per hour. And in the context here, John is not saying, Jesus is not saying, for God so loved this ball that's spinning through space. There's a lot of people that think that, that the world in which we live, that's, that's what God loves. And we need to be good stewards and make sure we protect the trees and the water. And all. We should be good stewards, but that's not what Christ came to die for. Amen? 
Christ did not come to die on a cross for the sins of the maple tree outside of my house. Christ came and died on a cross for my sins. And he came to die for your sins as well. So it's in a context, he's talking about this globe, this, this ball, this ornament, this decoration. But friends, it is the people on that decoration that God so loved in this way. Every single person. St. Augustine had this to say about this. If you wonder how much God loves you. God loves each one of us as if there was only one of us to love. He loves each one of us as if I'm the only one, as if you're the only one, as if you're the only one, and you're the only one, and you, and you, and you, and you, and you. God loves us like we're the only one and there's no other distraction. As a grandfather, uh, when my grandkids come over and they're at the house, boy, I love my grandkids. But, but, if, but if Oliver is asleep, it is all attention on, on Oakland. And I love her how? I love her like she's the only one, right? And, and then when she is napping and Oliver is awake and I get a chance to scoop up Oliver in my arms, I love him like he is the only one. I don't think we realize the extent that God loves you and me. That if you were the only one ever born on planet Earth, you still would be a sinner. You're welcome. And God still would love you enough that he would send his son to die on a cross for you and for me. Get a hold of the love of God today. And so Jesus spoke of the love, this love and what it looks like in John chapter 15. Jesus is speaking and says, this is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you in the same way that I have loved you, to the extent that I have loved you, in the manner that I have loved you, love one another. Verse 13, read this with me. Greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his friend. I, I, don't, I, I don't think that we understand how much God loved us until, and, and a few years ago, um, a friend of mine was complaining that they had gone to a church service and they, the, they passed out a little uh, cut nail, you know, those old fashioned square cut nails with a red ribbon on it to be able to hang it on the tree and a little scroll with John 3.16 on it. He goes, it's Christmas for crying out loud. Do we always have to talk about the cross and the resurrection? I said, uh, yeah. I said, if there's no cross and resurrection, Christmas doesn't have any meaning to me. He came to die on a cross for you and for me. And the fact that Jesus willingly laid his life down for you and for me. Amazing. For God so loved the world that he gave. He gave his only begotten son. That God sacrificed. He yielded up. He, he surrendered over his perfect son. I spent a lot of time this past week reading over uh, commentaries and notes on this phrase, only begotten son. And I got to tell you, I, my head is spinning for more reasons than one trying to understand it. But I always read it that the word begotten is born, God's only born son. But that, that's, not, that's not the case. One writer said this, and I'll see if I can explain it. God the Father has always been God the Father. There's never a time when God the Father was not God the Father. And then they said this. For an individual like me, there was a time when I was Glenn, not the Father. I didn't have any kids. And, and God's grace allowed us to have Jonathan, Jay, and Julia. And I became a father. But God the Father has always been God the Father, and God the Son has always been God the Son. There was never a time when God the Father did not have God the Son. 
And you say, that blows my mind. Yep, it does. And there are some things we just have to receive. God didn't birth Jesus. Jesus has always been with God the Father and the Holy Spirit as well. And so this phrase here that we see, his only begotten son, it, it has to do as much with the uniqueness of who Jesus is. There's none like him. He is, he is God deity. There's some that dispute this and say, no, Jesus wasn't really deity. He wasn't really God. No, he was. He was. And some have said that this phrase can be confusing. To me, it's not. God gave his only, his unique, his son in character, his son in the person of Jesus Christ that he gave to us. And notice this, that it's God who initiated it all. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. It all comes from God. It all comes from God to you. Isaiah chapter 9 verse 6, for unto us a child is born. It doesn't say for unto us I, I birthed a child. For unto us a child is born. For unto us a son is, is given. This prophetic word talking about the Messiah again reminds us and shows us that all of this is coming from God the Father, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. We didn't cause the Messiah child to be born. We didn't cause the Messiah son to be given. It was God who initiated this gift, that whoever believes in him whoever any all available to the whole it wasn't just for the jews it was for the jews and gentiles alike it wasn't just for those in the tribe of judah it was for all tribes and tongues throughout all the land it wasn't just for jesus's time when he was born friends it is for all of us down through history and down through time. It's not just for the rich or for a certain class of people. When it says whosoever, it means whoever and all. But the word whoever or whosoever, depending on your translation, grammatically it is singular. So while it says the whole, it's the whole individually. You and I can't ride into heaven on the coattails of mommy and daddy or grandma and grandpa or a husband or wife or our kids or our friends or a pastor. It's something, a decision that you and I have to make for ourselves. Whosoever believes in him, whoever trusts in him, whoever accepts what Christ did for them on the cross, as the full payment of their sin, recognizing their sinfulness and recognizing they stand judged and eternally damned before God, except for the baby born in the manger. But knowing the story of the manger isn't enough. It's putting your faith and trust and hope in the work of Jesus Christ, who lived and who died and was buried and rose again and conquered sin and death. It's not a matter of placing and believing in religion. It's not a matter of believing in church. Oh, if I go to church enough, then I'll be saved. It's not a matter of a denomination, this one or that one. It is placing our faith entirely in, in Jesus Christ. It's Jesus Christ. That's why we keep, we go back to the word and we keep pointing to Jesus. We go back to the word and we point to Jesus. We talk about it as a board. We talk about it individually in Sunday school, Bible study. We are just continuing to point people to Jesus. Why? Because it's through Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone that we are able to be saved. The Apostle Paul wrote to young Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15, when he said, This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance or worthy to receive, worthy to believe in. 
that Jesus, excuse me, that Christ Jesus came into the world. Why? To save sinners of whom I am chief. There's some here today you might say, you know what? I, I've given Paul a run for his money for being the worst of sinners. Maybe that's where you stand today. I just want to let you know, wherever you are, you're not so far removed from God that his love cannot reach you. For, for me, my thing wasn't so much as realizing God's love would reach me. It was me slowing down long enough and turn around and receive him. And stop running. And stop running. Have you believed in him? Have you believed that he's the son of God? Have you believed that Jesus was born of the virgin, that he lived a sinless life, and that he died on a cross for your sins and for mine, and that, that he rose again? The benefit, the payoff, the result of all this, for God so loving the world in this manner that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him, here it is, should not, should not perish, should not have spiritual death. Say, well, I'm fully alive. I haven't died yet, but are you spiritually alive? I walk through the stores and I see different people different times, especially at the Christmas season. And you look at some people and they're just walking along and pushing a cart. Boy, there's a sadness and an emptiness in their life. And I, and I wonder, are they, are they spiritually alive or are they spiritually dead? You don't have to be spiritually dead and away from God. Instead, we have everlasting life given to us through Jesus Christ. Paul says in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4 and 5, But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ. Even when we were dead in our transgressions, or even when we were dead in our sins, and it is by grace you have been saved. He made us alive because of what Christ did. It's the greatest gift. It's, but it sits for each one of us. It's like a package under the tree. We have packages under the tree for our family to open up today. I guarantee you there's none of those packages that will be left unopened today. Not one. And yet, throughout the world and throughout our lives, there are people that hear the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ and they will leave that package unopened and they will leave it untouched. They hear it, they know it, they know what's inside of it, but they will never pick it up and receive that free gift for themselves. See, John continues to record and remind us in verse 17, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. It's not why Christ came. No, it was but the world through him might be saved. There is no greater love than the love of Jesus Christ for you and for me, that he came for us. I hope that you have received him and accept him today. Will you bow with me in prayer? Father, today I pray for each one here. While we may be diligent to open presents under the tree. I pray for every individual here that we've opened up the greatest gift of all, and that is the salvation available through your son, Jesus Christ. Remind us, God, that we are sinners and we stand condemned because of our sin, but you've made a way for us to be forgiven, and it's by receiving the work of Jesus Christ. We've talked about it. It's been shared. I pray, Father, if there's anyone here that, that has not accepted your son, that they would do so today. That they would confess their sins and they would ask you to forgive them and to save them because of what Christ did on the cross for them. But for the rest of us, Lord, that we have accepted your son, Jesus. I thank you for it, and we thank you for salvation. Help us not to be silent, but help us to share it with the world around us and tell them of the greatest love ever given. Father, we thank you today for your love, and we thank you for your son, Jesus. It's in his name we pray these things. Amen.